Good morning. Yes, I am. Good morning, Sean. Thank you very much. And good morning to all the attendees and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was telling Sean earlier, just a few minutes ago, that um, the, you know we really need to sort out and and um, uh, work on the timing of these tech talks a little bit better, because this particular tech talk happens to be the morning after quite a heavy plumber's evening the night before. So um, that's why you know I'm a little bit I'm a one tenth slower than I than I usually am on on these tech talks or for that matter on any other webinar. So, but it is what it is. Uh, but welcome and thank you very much. I see the attendees are there's 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 very very good attendance. And this morning, <clears throat> you know, I thought we and 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 uh, again it, this would this tech talk would seem to be. One of those that um, sort of why are we rehashing the same subject again? Um, Giza overflows. We know what they are. We all know. We I think we've all pretty much attended um, tech talks that talk about the specific requirements of, for example, a TP discharge pipe and, and why it must be a certain size and a length and blah blah blah. And and uh, but I think I just wanted to go three or four steps back and just. Um, uh, stress again the the purpose of overflows uh, and what they are there for and what they were what they are intended to achieve in a plumbing system and I know it sounds like I'm uh, um, stating the obvious but the the you know we'll see uh, we'll get it there's only about seven slides so um, this is a 15 20 minute uh, long uh, session but um, it's just a quick little reminder as to what the purpose of overflows are and 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 the reason I thought that this was important enough to put it to put together a tech talk for is it speaks to if if we remind ourselves what the overflows are for we then don't have to um, wonder why they are configured the way they are configured in other words when the standards say to us it must be this size, it must be that, um, and don't join them together. And so that's the reason that, that does this. So I'm hoping just to <clears throat> revert back to reminding ourselves why it is that uh, these overflows are so important. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that it might come across as a little bit um, preaching to the converted, but I think it's just worth it for a quick 20-minute tech talk. Anyway, which overflows matter, by the way, um, if I were to pose that question? Well, I would say that uh, the answer is um, all of them. Every single overflow on a plumbing system, and remember we're talking about uh, a normal conventional geezer here. So there's three of them. There's the PRV, there's the uh, uh, TP, discharge pipe, and the tray overflow. So all of them matter. Um, so there's no one favorite or one crucial. Yes, we know that each one has its different roles, and we know that the TP, for example, can be a dangerous a animal. Um, but they all matter in the sense that they've all got a fun function to fulfill and we, we need to treat them each with uh, equal sort of uh, importance. Okay, what do overflows do? Now, this is a silly question because I'm addressing, you know, 150 plumbers here, so we all know what they do, but let's just go through it. Get rid of excess water. That is a safety function of the of, of TP, of of PRV uh, and of tray for that matter um, because without being able to get rid of excess water you've got uh, damage to property and 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 and, and if uh, even damage to person if you're talking about the TP. Certainly steam in the case of the TP that is also a safety function so those two functions are safety related um, but then they also it serves as a warning. What do you mean it serves as a warning? Well if you are able to see and witness 
uh, overflow coming from a particular overflow pipe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then you are able to, not 100% diagnose, but you're almost able to diagnose the problem with the geezer and, and give a very good guess to it, um, even over the phone. Okay, so they do serve as a warning and they say to the homeowner, hey, hang on a second, yesterday when I was here, there was no uh, overflow or there was no water dripping from this pipe. Now I get home this morning and all of a sudden there's water dripping. I better phone somebody and do something about it. And so that's why we say it can be used to diagnose problems to a certain extent, not really um, uh, to not 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 to take the place and not you can't be 100% sure of, of anything just by looking at something. But uh, it's it goes a long way in determining what problems are and what problems can be. So with this in mind, <clears throat> what do the standards tell us? Because we all fight against the standards and say, you know, oh, geez, you know, um, why did I have to go to 28 mil in the TP and this? And so what do the standards tell us with, with, with this in mind that these are the basic functions of overflow and that the standards tell us uh, various things and I'm not using the exact words verbatim uh, we're just sort of generalizing here they 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 say that the overflow pipes must be of a certain size that is something that they do say about the PRV and the um, TP right um, they also talk to the tray overflow but they don't talk about size they talk about liters per minute flow rate that they shall be of a certain length so they're not going to allow you to put overflow pipes in uh, 20 meters long uh, they, the, the the people who have done these calculations and the 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 um, calculations as to how a TP valve, for example, must perform and how it must uh, discharge water and how fast it must be able to discharge water and steam, for that matter, they've done their calculations. We must trust that they have done them uh, in in accordance with uh, whatever the requirements are, and they. Of, it's it's there in place to protect the cylinder, especially copper cylinders, um, and you know. So we, we, the, we know that the, the the longer a pipe is, and the the faster we asking water or anything for that matter to flow through that pipe, and the longer it is, the more friction loss occurs within the pipe. So there are restrictions as to the length of that pipe. Um, that they shall be capable of conveying water away at a certain rate under certain conditions and that's more or less uh there's two overflows that um would uh, fall under into that category that would be the tp it needs to convey water slash steam away at a certain rate a minimum rate and of course the drip tray overflow also falls under that category uh, and and uh, both of them I think, uh, speaking on a correction, but they've got minimum, they have to be able to discharge water slash steam at a minimum of 40 liters per minute. Um, the, in the case of the drip tray overflow, it is under natural fall conditions. In other words, there's no pressure behind it. It's, it's simply open to atmosphere. The, the pipe needs to be laid in such a way that it has a fall and that that water will be able to be discharged at 40 liters a minute. So it, it's quite critical that that it has a fall, that it hasn't got uh, excessive bends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is the 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 situation. They must be positioned appropriately. Now that uh, speaks to a few things. Um, you can think about safety. Uh, you can think about nuisance factor. You can think about uh, visibility. Because without being able to see the discharge from these things, you're not going to be able to tell that anything's wrong. So they must be, they have got a, a there are criteria governing uh, how they must be positioned. Uh, <clears throat> then they shall not be joined. You cannot join a TP with a PRV or a, put a PRV into a tray or a TP into a tray or something like that. Again, it's it's got to do with safety. It's got to do with um, a visibility and as a diagnostic tool or a diagnosis tool. And they shall not be of a risk, or well, they should not be a risk or, or a nuisance. So if it's going to be um, uh, risky to person or property or nuisance, then it's a no-go. 
Uh, I think overflows are something that we all we all know exist, and but I think it's almost like lagging, where it's a bit of an afterthought. Um, you know, where we're going to put the geezer? This is where the old geezer was. This is where the new geezer must go. There, the supports, <clears throat> the trays there. No problem. We'll just put the geezer there. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, now we're four and a half or five meters away from the outside wall. Ugh, it's okay. We'll just put the overflows. Where are we going to go to? Where's the closest outside wall? There it is. Oh, yeah. Is it above a window? Don't care. There it is. Just put it in. And boom. This sort of thing does happen. Not all the time, but it does happen. I think overflows are almost an afterthought. Um, and we do need to just remind ourselves how important the various factors are when positioning overflows. This is an extreme case, I grant you. It's not something that you're going to see, you know, every day and, and by the, by the um, uh, 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 what is this, uh, watermarks. You can see that this is a picture that I got off the net. So it's not a picture that I've taken. <clears throat> I don't mind saying that. But still, this is a... Um, a, 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 a possibility it's it's a it's a scenario that could occur if an overflow isn't uh, installed properly uh, that little pipe has obviously got a slight backfall and the water runs back along the underside of that pipe and drips down the wall and it causes tremendous damage to to the property and <clears throat> it's not unique I didn't um, necessarily have to uh, um, I mean if I really trawl through all of my pictures that I've got um, which are in a thousand different files, I'll probably find something similar, but this was just easier. The point is that this sort of thing happens often. The fact that that overflow is put above a window um, it shows a bit of a lack of, for, of forethought, and it does cause damage to property, and, it, and over time it can cause severe damage to property. Not only damage to property, but it can be a nuisance, and this, the standards do specifically state that overflows shall not be a nuisance to whoever lives in the property. So, if and and that 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 is almost subjective. So you can, um, uh, you know, one's one person's um, definition of a nuisance is is not the same as another person's definition. So, be careful about that because if the homeowner decides that it's a nuisance, then if a reasonable person, let's say, would decide that it's a nuisance, then it is a nuisance and it would uh, it be, be non-compliant as a result uh, because it can be shown to be a nuisance. And we're not talking about necessarily damage to any property. We're just talking about being a nuisance. So if the homeowner doesn't like it dripping there because it makes a noise at night and uh, it's outside his, uh, his baby's um, bedroom window, and his ba he thinks that his baby wakes up every two hours because of the dripping of the overflow, well, <laughs> you know, then he's going to come back to you and say, hey, change this thing. So nuisance factor is, is it's, it's actually stated in the, uh, in the standards. Obviously, it can cause damp. It can cause damp outside. Um, it can cause moss growth on a paving or a section of paving, for example, that uh, over time can become slippery um, or unsightly. Um, if it's close to an entrance, somebody might, um, uh, you know, walk past it one day and decide that it's, oh, this wasn't there two months ago and now look at it and it looks terrible. And whose fault is it? It's the plumber's fault, you know. So we must just remember to bear, to, to keep in mind the overflow positioning when we do geezers. And, and, and just, I know most of us do actually because it is something that we that we think about, but often, every now and again, we're all human beings. Every now and again, we kind of just say, "Oh, you know, I'll just take it out the closest thing here." So this is just good. And then damage to property. Obviously, if there is a property involved where a, a overflow hasn't been taken out correctly, for example, if it's not completely uh, protruding through a a, 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 um, a roof space or a um, an eave, and it's dripping onto the eave, for example, it can cause damage to that eave. The the ceilings, uh, sometimes leaking overflows can cause damage to cupboards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That speaks for itself. I don't need to elaborate. But then, very importantly, 
I think the diagnosis, the, the the ability, or let me let me rephrase the the um, the function of overflows as a diagnostic tool are very 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 important, and that's why the standards say to us, don't join them together, and don't hide them. So when we talk about hiding them, if a PRV discharge is dripping intermittently uh, three times or four times a day and Mrs. Jones is able to see it and she gets used to it and she knows it and it's dripping nicely into a pot plant and her pot plant is thriving and she's loving it. But one day she gets home and it's running, it's dribbling constantly and she notices it again three minutes later, it hasn't stopped, another five minutes goes by, it has, still hasn't stopped and it's dribbling and it's faster than usual. Now she's, that is, that is, that is a warning to her saying, hang on, something's changed. She doesn't know what the difference, what the problem is. She doesn't, she's got no idea about plumbing, but she does know that something's changed. And she does know that she can see this in its normal behavior pattern, and now it's a different behavior pattern. So that is a visible overflow, and that is why the standards require us to make overflows visible. The same goes for TP discharge pipe. <clears throat> if she sees a TP discharge pipe that has never ever been uh, so much as damp in her life and all of a sudden it starts squirting steam and water, obviously she's going to uh, be alarmed and, and pick up the phone and phone somebody. So if it's visible, it's good. Bearing in mind that it can't be a nuisance or, or a safety factor, but it has to be visible. Same story with a drip tray overflow. Now. If you join the three overflows or discharge a TP into a tray or a PRV into a tray for that matter, and you and you have a drip from the tray's overflow, which is a constant drip because if the PRV is in there, it's going to be intermittent and constant. And you speak to Mrs. Jones and she says, no, no, that pipe always overflows and it's every day. And, and my plumber said that it was normal. The guy that put the geese in said it's normal because that's the dis, the, but whatever. But now what happens if something starts to leak into the tray? And so she looks at that dripping and she says, oh, but that's just the normal dripping, and she doesn't do anything about it for, you know, two weeks or something. So the point is that we are doing the clients a disservice by not following the standards. So never join uh, discharges together or overflows together, and don't hide them. And that means if you are forced to put them into a stack, uh, now TP can't go into a PVC stack, we know that because of the heat, but if you if you, let's say it's a cast iron or whatever the case may be, you have to do it with an air gap or a, and a tundish that is capable of, of, of accepting the flow from that overflow um, so that the air gap allows it to be discernible. You must be able to see the, 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 the drip or the discharge or whatever is occurring so that you can be notified or be warned of, of something occurring there. Just a couple of examples of um, guys getting it wrong. Uh, this is a TP overflow pipe uh, and a tray overflow pipe. The uh, the PRV overflow went uh, uh, into another into another position. I think it went onto that roof. So this is just TP and tray. But this uh, particular property over here is a, a balcony of a, a, an apartment in a frail care centre in Cape Town that I had a look at, and the and quite literally it's a frail care center the the lady that stays in this particular apartment is in need of frail care she is in she has a 24 hour helper um and this is her balcony and she it goes without saying that um she's not as mobile as you and I so when she's sitting here she's pretty much sitting there unless somebody comes out and helps her up and and yet there's the tp discharge pointing straight down at her. <clears throat> so that is, and by the way, this was a geyser replacement, and this was the original position of the TP discharge. So the plumber didn't install the TP discharge there. He just neglected to sort of move it, okay? He, I don't, whether it, whether it was noticed or not, I don't know. But he neglected to rectify the, the, the dangerous situation. The tray overflows fine. I mean, let's be honest, if something leaks and it drips down there, so what, it's fine. But the TP discharge is not safe. So that is, and it, particularly in this particular uh, uh, um, circumstance, uh, in, like I've described, a frail care center. This is a, a house up 
uh, in the west coast, I believe. Door, uh, TP discharge, PRV, you can say, see goes into the tray uh, uh, discharge pipe there, or the tray overflow and 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 out there. But the TP, particularly, is problematic because there's a door. Uh, the PRV, um, if this picture wasn't cut off at the bottom here, I had to put it like this because to, to get the, I want to emphasize this, um, you would see that the bottom paving over here just outside the doorway is completely, uh, permanently damp, it's mossy, it's slippery, and dampness attracts dust and dirt, and so you are constantly traipsing through mud to get in and out of this door. So that is a completely unacceptable um, situation for overflows. Okay, and then lastly, uh, as a diagnosis tool, and just to, I know I'm preaching to the, conver to the converted, uh, because we all know this, uh, but just to remind ourselves that properly installed overflows can be used as diagnostic tools. So a slow intermittent drip from a PRV we would say that that's probably the correct function because it's it's allowing um, discharge at least. Um, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, 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 the expansion from from water that's being heated to to come out. So that's the correct function. So slow intermittent drip. Mrs. Jones, what's it doing? It's doing that. Okay, no, don't worry about it. That's fine. Two two and a half liters a day. You should be okay. Fast running from the PRV overflow. That's probably a dirty or a faulty PRV, so you could diagnose that over the phone almost. Um, slow dribble from the TP overflow, you could almost certainly diagnose that as a faulty PRV. Again, it's a pressure-related thing. It's not a catastrophic sort of steam release from the thing. Uh, it's a it's a pressure-related um, discharge from the TP, so you could probably say that it's the PRV that's faulty. If it's a fast, hot steam overflow, uh, hot water, we all know the, the, the story there, it's going to be a faulty thermostat. So there already we have two pipes, each of which behaving in two different ways, and we are able to immediately narrow it down to a particular component. Um, and then obviously any kind of flow from the drip tray overflow is a leak on the hot water cylinder or a component which is situated above it. So it's the 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 point is, and and I'm not trying to teach you this in terms of um, uh, trying to teach you what a particular overflow means, but just to remind ourselves again that properly installed overflows that are visible can be used just for more than uh, more than just for. Uh, uh, um, discharge of water and it, they can be diagnostic tools as well and five minutes over Sean but uh, that's that's about it so I don't know if there's any questions I don't think there would be many because uh, I think that uh, I'm preaching to the converted here but um, yeah that's it back to you all right, perfect. Well, we do have two questions for you this morning. Get right into it. The first one reads, just to confirm that on all plastic pipe, including MLP, the spacing brackets must be 300 millimeters on the PRV pipe leading out of the ceiling. Yes, so the standards, when they talk about bracketing of uh, MLP, uh, or any plastic pipes for that matter, and it's 15 millimeter, the minimum, or at, uh, sorry, the maximum distance between brackets is 300 millimeters. Yes. Now, the, so so you you must understand which cap uh, I'm wearing now, and the cap is um, I'm telling you what the standards require. Reasonableness comes into it. I know that as overflows go towards an eave, um, <laughs> space becomes impossible, and so let's be honest. If you if you if if you can't get a bracket on the last, you know, I mean, really. So nobody's really going to shout and scream about it as long as the thing hasn't got any water traps. That's the important thing. If you've got water traps uh, or backflow situations, then a, a, as we said, with with a section of paving that um, that is constantly wet, it attracts dust and dirt and and all kinds of debris to it. It's just a fact of life. The same thing happens in a water trap of a of a of a discharge pipe. If it's constantly wet, if you've got a belly in the pipe which has uh, got a little bit of a water trap, trust me, stuff gets in there. 
and eventually it can restrict the flow. So as long as it's bracketed to a point where it's never going to develop water traps, it's never going to, it's it's always going to allow proper drainage of the pipe, etc., etc., etc. Then I think we're all happy. But yes, the standards do say that 300 mil, excuse me, are the is the mini, the maximum distance allowed between brackets for a half inch plastic pipe. Right, the next question reads, to avoid con confusion regarding lengths, bends and diameters concerning TP pipes, why not make one inch copper pipe the standard for SANS 10254? What percentage of us is getting it wrong in audits and PRB for bidded installations uh, not logged or reported? Yeah, I can't speak to how many uh, installations are getting it wrong that are not logged, that are not COC'd. Um, I would guess thousands, uh, tens of thousands. Um, look, I I think uh, making it would not look. The the standards have always been there. So the standards, the 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 size requirements in the within the standards have always been there. It's just that I think it's come to light. And it's probably being enforced a little bit m more now than it was in the past. And so now there's it's in the forefront of our minds the size thing. So the 28 millimeter having to go to 28 if it's longer than four meters, etc. Uh, and and that has caused I'm not going to say it's caused <clears throat> because the standards have always been there. They haven't changed. Nobody's changed the standards. So it's been there. They're just being enforced now. Um, but, but that has um, um, caused some, let's put it very mildly, uh, eyebrows to raise, okay, which is putting it very mildly. And, and I'd say it's caused a bit of um, upset in the marketplace. Imagine if we, and, and, and remember that PRB is unable to change or make any kind of regulations, okay? We act on what the standards require. So we we can't say for example uh, okay tomorrow we must just make one inch uh, pipes from tp overflow it, it we can't do that we this prb haven't got the power to do that there's a whole big process to go through and you need to justify it and tests need to be done and manufacturers need to be consulted and so on and so forth so it's a it's a it's a long process but the the, the yeah having said that the i think the the the, the the length requirements for a TP overflow, particularly, um, are quite simple. That sounds like it's a, it's a bit of a mission, but but four meters, you're just two distances, four meters and nine meters. Those are the two maximums. Uh, maximum for 22 is four, maximum for 28 is nine. And then the bends, you're allowed three. But if you go over three, for each extra one, you reduce maximum distance by 600. So there's there's just those three facts to remember and if we can bear that in mind then we should be safe we, sh we should be safe but it's a big process to try and change a standard all right so we've got about 30 seconds left if we can get just get a quick answer from the following two questions the first one reads are 90 degree bends allowed to be used on a tray overflow as the tray overflow it needs a discharge rate of 40 liters per minute if you can show that using 90 degree bends will still allow for that flow then yes all right perfect and and then the last question reads i've got two geezers can i use a prv for two geezers or do i have to install another one for a new geezer that the system is not balanced if it's uh, two geezers are in series then you can then you can uh, uh, use it as one or think of it as one geezer or one storage tank or you know in series but if they are two separate geezers serving two separate areas of the home then you need two prvs all right okay so that is all of the questions we have got this morning um so i'm going to go ahead and end off the session um, thank you, Richard, uh, for taking the time out to prepare these sessions. Um, and then thanks, guys, for joining us. Um, I will go ahead and end off the session now, guys. Please remember the survey on the way out and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys.